This week at Starbase, boosters trade places at the build site. Ship 37 makes its way back to Mega Bay 2, and construction continues at the launch site as well as the sites for the new Gigabay and air separation plant. With so much action in every corner of Starbase right now, could there be any possible delays to Flight 10? And when is the soonest that SpaceX could possibly launch? Well, let's dig into this week's update and find out. Starting off with our fabrication updates, the Starlink loader was taken out of Star Factory and sent over to Mega Bay 2, where it stopped in front of the center work stand with Starship 38, and crews began rigging the box for a lift. Mega Bay 2's front door was closed at that point, blocking the view inside, but 36 hours later, the Starlink loader was brought out of the bay and returned to the Star Factory. After the Starlink loader's work was done, Ship 38 was moved off of the center workstation and placed on the back left workstand. Moving on to our rollout and testing updates, over at the launch complex, workers began preparations to send Ship 37 back to the production site, lowering the workstand from beneath the ship and sending the transport stand to Pad A. The ship's ground infrastructure interface plate was removed, leaving the ship ready to be removed from the launch mount. Several hours later, with hardware removed and the transport stand in place, Ship 37 was lifted off the launch mount. Crews took their time with the ship, and it spent quite some time in the air before it was set down on the transport stand near the tower. The chopsticks released the ship a few hours later, and Ship 37 began its journey back to the production site. Once the ship arrived at the build site, it was brought into Mega Bay 2, and workers positioned the ship for lift onto the center work stand so that the ship's heat shield and other remaining pre-flight items can be worked on ahead of Flight 10. With Ship 37 off the launch mount now, workers began reconfiguring Pad A for regular flight operations. Workers began to disassemble the ship interface system, and the crane was brought over to remove the ring adapter from the launch mount. After its removal, the adapter was taken out of the launch site and brought to Sanchez. Making use of a crane, workers began to reinstall the hold-down clamps on the launch mount. Fifteen were finished before the crane was retracted. Moving on to construction updates, this week at the launch site, we saw the arrival of the new liquid oxygen side booster quick disconnect hood. The hood was soon installed on the launch table at Pad B, providing protection for the umbilical mechanisms inside. After Ship 37 was taken off the launch mount, workers began removing the ship quick disconnect pipe work from the makeshift umbilical on Pad A. Work on Pad B continued with the placement of concrete near the base of the gantry structure. The trench wall moved a step closer to completion with the addition of one of the slope sections to the wall. The trench is a composite steel wall structure that will be filled with concrete. Another reinforced vaporizer and pipe segment were also installed at the launch site this week as SpaceX continues its upgrade and replacement work at the complex. Although Ship 37 was sent back to the build site and workers began dismantling the improvised test equipment, it seems that the static fire didn't go as well as previously thought. Workers began removing the 15 clamps that had been reinstalled on the launch mount and the modified ship stand was also lifted back onto the launch mount for another static fire test. Over at the build site, one of the Raptor vacuum engines was swapped out on Ship 37 to be test-fired in the near future. This change in plans will delay things a bit, and SpaceX filed a new notice to Mariners on the 8th, with Flight 10 now launching no earlier than the 22nd. The umbilical pipes were also replaced on the ship quick disconnect hardware as crews reassembled the device after workers had previously begun to take it apart. A new bunker is under a construction outside the D2 gate, which will house and protect critical equipment at the complex. Additional steel continues to be delivered to the launch site as workers continue to build the bunker. Just across the road, grading work is progressing at the site of the new air separation plant. The ninth and final liquid oxygen pump was installed at the new and expanded propellant pumping station, bringing the facility to its full capacity. Back at the build site, the continuous flight auger drills were dismantled and lowered. The auger bits were then loaded onto a truck and removed from Starbase. A concrete pump truck began laying the rat slab for Gigabay, covering the ground in a thin layer of concrete to protect against moisture and, as the name suggests, tunneling rodents and other pets that can damage the groundworks while the main slab is being prepared. Meanwhile, excavators continue to dig around the other piles at the construction site, clearing the way for the foundation slab. Booster 16 was moved out of Mega Bay 1 with its grid fins in its customary rotated position before being leveled out. 
After an inspection of the grid fins, the booster was moved into the rocket garden, where it will stay until it's brought back to the launch pad for Flight 10. Inside the garden, crews were manually tilting Booster 12's grid fins before moving the booster out of the garden and over to Mega Bay 1. The booster was then moved into the bay and its grid fins rotated back into the neutral position. After a bit of repositioning inside, the main door was closed ahead of the booster being moved onto a work stand where it's expected to be prepared for long-term display. After that, the transport stand was brought back to Sanchez. This week at the Cape, we saw the post-flight wrap-up of the Starlink Group 10-29 mission, which just read the instructions returning to Port Canaveral with Booster 1069 after its 26th flight. The booster was unloaded at the dockside stands, where it was safed and stowed before being sent back to Roberts Road. Just read the instructions was back at sea the same day as it arrived, ready to support the Starlink Group 10-30 mission. Early Monday morning, Falcon 9 Booster 1080 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40, sending the next batch of Starlink satellites into low Earth orbit. After its successful flight, Bob returned with fairing halves 191 and 212, while Just Read the Instructions came back a bit later with Booster 1080 after its 21st flight for offloading onto the dockside stands. There was a small fire underneath Booster 1080 at the docks, which is probably a controlled burn-off of the remaining supply of TTEP ignition fluids. In other space news, Vast Space's Haven Demonstration Satellite underwent electromagnetic compatibility and susceptibility testing, verifying that its flight hardware and Dragon communication links were working as designed on the ground and in space. The Federal Aviation Administration released a new environmental impact statement for the Starship flights out of Launch Complex 39A, detailing the revised site plans, post-flight recovery operations, re-entry corridors, and area restrictions for launch operations. A new battery storage system and new propellant storage plots are detailed in the revised EIS. The new layout of the launch site with the flame trench system seen at Starbase Pad B are also visible. Post-flight recovery options for downrange landing show hardware recovery through Port Canaveral, while the notional range of a downrange entry stretches from Central America through much of the Florida Panhandle. The proposed launch restriction area is extensive, blocking off Space Launch Complex 39B, 40, and 41. Playa Linda Beach, a popular launch viewing site, will also be restricted. The swing arm for Mobile Launcher 2 was lifted and installed as the launcher moves towards supporting future launches of the Space Launch System. UK launch company Skyrora became the first launch service provider to receive a commercial operations license in the United Kingdom for the suborbital Skylark L rocket. United Launch Alliance CEO Tori Bruno showed some progress pictures of Vulcan Mobile Launcher 2 and integration facilities where work is underway for electrical, hypergolic, and propellant hookups for the vehicle and payloads. NASA's Exploration Ground Systems team is now halfway through the integrated testing pre-flight checklists for Artemis 2, which is on schedule for a launch in April 2026. Nord Space published new construction photos from their launch site where they'll be launching their suborbital Tiger rocket. NASA has selected six companies to provide design studies and proposals for orbital transfer vehicles, which aim to improve access to difficult orbits. The six companies selected are Aeroscience and Technology, Blue Origin, Firefly Aerospace, Impulse Space, Rocket Lab, and United Launch Services. Firefly Aerospace rang the opening bell for Thursday's trading session at the NASDAQ Stock Exchange for the company's initial public offering. Rocket Lab published a status update on their Neutron rocket, highlighting the work that's been done, work that's in progress, and work yet to begin before the first flight of their new, partially reusable launch vehicle. Famed former Gemini and Apollo astronaut Jim Lovell passed away on August 7th at 97 years of age. Jim was part of the first crew to ever fly around the moon on Apollo 8 and was the mission commander for Apollo 13. Beyond his historic achievements, Captain Lovell will be missed by his family, friends, and spaceflight enthusiasts everywhere. And there you have it, another weekly space update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.